to do it today. I just wanted to show that. So welcome. Good to see you guys. Um, actually, it does. As you saw the uh, subtitle, it's You've Lost That Loving Feeling. It's going to have a double meaning here in just a little bit, but we are um, just three weeks from finishing today and two more weeks of finishing our Spectator series, and then we're jumping into the rest of the year of spiritual formation where we're really going to hone in on the practical ways we can actually input these things into our life and be formed and follow Jesus, okay? So the classic Top Gun love story full of pursuit rejection, passion, romance, and ultimately a happy ending. The movies back then depicted these fairy tale romances that seemed single people longed to be true in their lives. But can we be honest with each other for a minute? Let's be honest. You ready? Yeah? Say yes. It's really hard to love today, isn't it? Let's say yes again. Yeah. It just is especially if you're a follower of Jesus. Sometimes it's hard to love your spouse and your kids. Yeah? <laughs> you're a little more cautious on that one. She's sitting right next to me, man. <laughs> Look, I'll be honest with you. I know I'm hard to love. My wife is perfect. She's never hard to love. I know I'm hard to love. It's good, right? It's brownie points. <laughs> We're supposed to love those people who are against us. That's hard. Our coworkers who we can't stand is hard. Our very difficult family members. And then just to top it all off, people who are on the other side of the political spectrum, the other side of the mask and the vaccine debates. Jesus says some crazy things like not only just love them, but pray for them too. It's like, come on, Jesus. What? How is this possible to love people like this today? And we like these fairy tale romances because we want them. They don't seem attainable to us. And when real love is presented in our lives, man, it is just hard. It's just difficult. And so when we say things like you've lost that loving feeling, honestly, I think we can all relate to that because it's really difficult to love people today. It's really hard. But let's fast forward to today. The movie relationships look very different today. The guy or girl of your dreams doesn't mean much anymore because that doesn't really exist. You have so many options now that you never had before, and they're all acceptable today. I want to share some insights into today's relationship culture so you can understand where we are at as a society. For all of you that are single, this is your world. For those of you that are in relationships or married, you need to understand what relationships are like today to understand how to navigate conversations towards sharing the gospel, okay? So the, world, the word love is misused and confused so much these days. And so Cosmopolitan, uh, incredibly horrible magazine, has compiled a survey from all of the top dating experts of today to talk about what love is going to look like from now on. There's something called wander love. You've found all the people you want to date around here. Nobody is good enough. So this is where you travel to a different country to hopefully spark up a romance or turn it into something, maybe just a fling, but it'll be good for you. You should go. Being consciously single. There is now no more single shaming. Congratulations, those of you that are single. Quarantine taught people that they can be alone longer and don't need to be in relationships. Just go out and sleep around or be celibate. Just have fun. The dating app Hinge says that 83% of people who are looking to date are looking to date people who are already in therapy. Here's something for those of you that get a first date. If you mention therapy on your first date, you're guaranteed a second date. <laughs> I wish I was lying, but I am not. You'll go, this is called untyping. You'll actually go for other types than you normally do, and then there's relationship go-getters. They will no longer settle, and they will demand to date someone that is exactly what they want. Otherwise, they will remain single. Did you get that? I added the last part. Y'all, come on, like, you need to, like, wake up today, like, engage with me a little bit, because I'm not sure what's happening right now, but y'all are... Here's the last one. I saved the best one for last. You ready? Hetero flexibility. This is the number of people identifying as straight is on the decline. Our society is more sexually fluid than ever before, and boundaries between cishet and LGBTQIA plus are beginning to blur as a result. Q, hetero flexibility. 
we believe that in 2022, more individuals will be identifying as hetero flexible, which is predominantly hetero, but also capable of same-sex attraction or attraction to a variety of genders and embracing the nuances of love and lust. As you can see, things are very different from the way love is depicted in the 1986 release of the movie Top Gun. What I want you to understand about what I just said to you is this is the reality of our world. And so when I say things to you like love is really difficult, it's really difficult for everybody. If you're in the dating scene today, I, honestly, like, I, I genuinely pity you. I really do. <laughs> I say that in the best way possible. <laughs> and I know that was a pity laugh. <laughs> I could not imagine trying to find somebody in this day and age in this culture. If, and I, I'm just going to move on. Here we go. <laughs> We're spending the entire year and more growing together in this spiritual formation. We feel like God has showed us through some incredible men of God that this is the missing piece between connecting someone to actually following, to actually from believing in him. This is what we mean when we say spiritual formation. This is Dallas Willard, and he sums it up the best, I think. He says, when we talk about spiritual formation, we're talking about framing a progression of life in which people come to actually do all of the things that Jesus taught. Now, I want you to pause for a minute, and those of you that know anything about the Bible, I just want you to measure yourself right here for a second before we move on. There's, a, there's an idea that we can theorize and we can memorize and we can understand everything about biblical culture, but when it comes to actually doing those things in our life, that is what spiritual formation is. We are forming ourselves and the people that we're in contact with into becoming actual followers of Jesus. He goes on to say, the, uh, so we are obviously going for the heart. We are aiming for change of the inner person where what we do originates. Now, this is where our love originates. So whatever your idea of love is sitting in here this morning, this is why this is going to be difficult for you or fairly simple for you. Because for you, maybe you saw what love looks like growing up, and it was actually a really good, healthy, biblical picture of what love looked like. For some of you, man, love got shaped so differently in the way that you grew up. This is really difficult for you. For some of you, maybe it was okay, but then you were confused as you got older, and now you honestly don't even really know what you think about love. Maybe you don't even think it's possible to love somebody else. But what I want you to realize is that when Jesus calls us to something, he's actually calling us through the love he had to come to earth and actually die and make salvation possible. His whole entire motive is love. So we need to understand this, okay? Now, it's funny how we think about love when we're little kids. Would you guys agree? Like when you're a little kid thinking about love, you don't really know anything. Here's what you know. You started thinking boys or girls are gross and they have cooties, right? That quickly changes though, doesn't it? <laughs> we then move on to like, I kind of like being around you and weird stuff happens like my armpits sweat and my hands get all wet. What the heck is that? But I'm just going to punch you instead of tell you I like you. <laughs> And then we go on to, oh man, every time I'm near you, my stomach is turning inside, my heart beats fast, and I lose all ability to make complete sentences. <laughs> we start to understand love a little differently as we get older. My favorite pickup line to date is my son, Dylan. My son, Dylan, smooth operator. He is a sophomore at a brand new school, and he sees the girl of his dreams, come home day one and tells us about this blonde beautiful girl that he's going to marry. I said, do you even know her name? No, but she's the one. And so this fast forwards a few weeks later, they're both walking out of the building. She goes over to her car because she's older and can drive. And Dylan gets up the courage to walk over to her car. As he knocks on the window, she rolls it down and he goes, hey, what's up? Do you know what the weather's going to be tomorrow? <laughs> and she's like, no. He's like, Okay, bye. <laughs> and the rest is history, as they say. The beautiful girl is now his wife, and they've been going on two and a half years. Yeah, pretty awesome. So you don't have to have a great pickup line, gentlemen. But I guess it started for me when I was about six. My parents told me that I had this girlfriend, quote unquote, at church. I don't remember her name, so it was obviously serious. But as they started to tell me how I acted around her, it was pretty funny. I'd say things like, I loved her, I was going to marry her one day, and I tried to hold her hands at all times. The problem was she was 21. 
She was obviously a sweet girl to entertain my nonsense, but that is the first memory I have of butterflies in my stomach. Of course, the second memory is my now wife, no other girls at all. Love is a very mixed emotion, isn't it? We say that we love a certain restaurant, a favorite t-shirt, a band, our kids, our spouse, a significant other, and Jesus, all in the same context. And this is why I believe that following Jesus is so hard for us. When he says things like, you, have, you should have so much love for me that it looks like you don't even love anybody else, your wife, your kids, your mom, your dad, compared to what we know from love, that seems impossible, doesn't it? Let me show you what I mean where I think we get off here. Look at this slide. This guy's name is Rollin Stewart. For some of you, you may recognize him. This is known as the John 316 guy. Anybody recognize this guy? Yeah, if you watch sports, you've seen this guy inevitably around every sports thing you can possibly imagine. This guy was, his whole world was sports. And so he would get in all of the best seats and he would cheer and he would dance crazy in front. He was always on the camera. And then one night sitting in his hotel room, he started to listen to an evangelist and he surrendered his life to Christ. And so he said, all of these sporting events need to know about the love of Jesus. And so he started holding up this giant sign that said John 316. Well, this radically shifted when he didn't think people were getting it, and he started actually using violent ways to get the love of Jesus out, and is now in prison, because it's not the way this should have went. But I think this is the most popular verse in all of Scripture. I'm going to prove my point. Let's say it together. You ready? For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Nice. Now, this is our idea of love, and it should be. This is the declaration of the greatest love to ever be displayed. Jesus sacrificed on the cross for humanity who did not deserve it. But let's say one more verse together. You ready? Luke 9, 23. Ready? Then he said to them all, if anyone wants to follow after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. Cheaters. But we don't know that verse very well, do we? The other one's way easier to quote. It's way easier to stomach because it talks about belief. This is following. There's a really big difference in this. See, John 3, 16 is where we form our idea of love, and this is where we believe who Jesus is, what he is doing to offer in salvation, how we can respond to that. I mean, God so loved the world, he sent his own son. That's incredible. That all who believe in him would not perish but have the everlasting life. That's amazing. That's where it starts for us. And then Jesus says, now follow me. Here's the follow verse. We go, ooh, I like the believe one better, Jesus. Because this is way more difficult, isn't it? If anyone wants to follow after me, let him or her deny themselves, take up their cross, daily and follow me. This is a daily relationship. Now, when we start to see the difference between believing and following, you'll see why we are doing spiritual formation. Because believing in Jesus is where our salvation starts. Following after him is where he expects us to go next. This is the crux of our series, church. Let me ask you a question. We have two more to go after this. Do you think it's possible? You don't have to answer me out loud. But do you think it's possible to believe in Jesus, not follow what he says to do, and still call yourself a follower of Jesus? I just want you to ponder that question. I want you to think about what he's saying. Because you clearly saw two differences in two different verses in Scripture, both by Jesus. Let me put it to you a, a, a simple way, okay? I just celebrated 25 years with Amanda. We were gone last week. But let's say on Monday nights I visited my girlfriend in Franklin. Wednesday was my indie girlfriend, and Friday around lunch was my Southport girlfriend. But I promised and swore I'm devoted to my wife, and I love her dearly. I say things to her like, I'm all yours on the weekends. I'll be home every night with you. I provide a good living for you. I take you on vacation. I don't even see why you would question if I truly love you. You're my wife. I just have girlfriends on the side. Would you guys agree that I probably love her wholeheartedly and she's my one and only? <laughs> this is a false story if anyone just tuned in online, by the way. See, when you put this into relationship terms, 
it's easy to see the difference in believing and following. It's, it's easy to see the difference in like, no, I love her, and then what our actions do to prove those things. So let me ask this again. Do you think it's possible to believe in Jesus, not follow what he says to do, and still call yourself a follower of Jesus? And we're already here in Luke 9, 23, so let's go to it. Let's read the whole thing in its context. In 9, verse, starting in verse 23, here's what he says. If anyone wants to follow after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. We're going to break that verse down over the next two weeks very deeply and intentionally so we can really see what Jesus is saying here. But for whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life because of me will save it. And then I can imagine Jesus like sitting and going, let me, let me ask you a question. What does it benefit somebody if he gains the whole world and yet loses or forfeits himself? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes in his glory, and that of the Father and of the holy angels. Truly I tell you, there are some standing here who will not taste death, and they will see the kingdom of God. Anytime Jesus speaks and asks us questions, they're so intentional and provoking, aren't they? He wants us to ponder, what is our pursuit of life really about, honestly? I want you to think away the way that you're shaped from a child. It doesn't matter who your parents were, how great a Christians they were, how horrible a people they were, whatever it is. You're raised in a foster system, you're raised by a care provider, whatever it is. I want you to think about how your mentality was starting to be shaped as a child. Look, let me just be honest with you. Nobody told you anything that wasn't already inside of you first, by the way. Because our flesh has all the capabilities of doing whatever we want against whoever we want from birth. If you don't believe me, try to teach a child how to, to play nice with, you, with each other when there's only one toy in the room and they don't know any better. Where did they get that stingy, I will punch you in the face attitude as a two-year-old? It's inside of them already, right? And so what happens is whatever it is that appeals to our flesh, most of the time is how we are going to live life. So if you heard, go to college, get a good job, drive a nice car, have a nice house, get a good retirement, then that is probably what you have striven for your whole entire life. And then Jesus says something like, hey, let me ask you though, what if you got all of that stuff and you actually lost your, yourself, you actually lost your own life? What would that benefit you? See, when we look at the things that we pursue in life as important, I, I'm going to ask you a very sobering reality question. You ready? This is not even hard for you to figure out. I'll make a statement first and then a question. This isn't even hard for you to figure out. What is it that is the primary pursuit of your life? Now, let's not be over-spiritual here and go, it's Jesus, and I'm going to tell you how you find out. You ready? Just here in a little bit, when we leave church, just open up your calendar, see where your time goes, click open your bank account, and look at the last month's transactions, and then see what it is that you work and do so you can do. You save, you make money so you can do these things. Really simple, right? Just three things. You can, you can tell exactly what it is that you live life for. Now, Jesus says, hey, um, I, in fact, am actually bidding you to come and die. You lay your life down because I have now rescued you and set you free, which means all those pursuits... I'm not saying you're not going to be able to pursue them, but those no longer become the main things of your life. I do. So then you pursue them in light of me. Jesus, is this the job you want me to have? Because they want to promote me, and that means I'll never be able to go to City Life communities, and I'll never be able to be at church on Sunday. But man, the money I would make, I, I'll help people, Jesus. Like we barter with God on things like this because our pursuit and the things that are the most important in our life are our lives. And this is why Jesus asked such a sobering question. See, it's different when we believe and then we kind of follow Jesus. And it's different than when we're all in for following Jesus. This question is some 
that Jesus, if he were walking with us today, would not let us get away from answering, church. And so I just want to ask you, what is it that is the pursuit of your life? Because the verse after that, he says, whoever is ashamed of me and my words, the Son of Man will be ashamed when he comes in glory. Now, I don't think any of us as followers of Jesus would consciously say we're ashamed of him. But his lifestyle is really different than the lifestyle of the world. And when he says things like, honestly, like, I don't, I don't care what car you drive. I don't even care where you live. I don't care about your retirement, your 401k, or how well you did in the stock market or Bitcoin. None of that matters to me. What matters to me is you're doing what I have called you to do. What matters to me is that when you look at me in the face one day and I go, how did you do with what I gave you? What should be important to you, Mike, are hearing the words, well done, good and faithful serving. On the end of that, it's not going to be well done in your stock portfolio. That's amazing. <laughs> he doesn't care about that. Now, what I want you to see, church, is, is we can blur and blend these lines very easily and over-spiritualize them, and they're just not the reality of what Jesus is calling us to do. So as we, this is where we're going to dive much deeper for the next two weeks, because I want you to see the reality and the practical ways where we can move towards this, okay? It's not as hard as you think, I promise. I know it sounds like a lot, but it's not. If anyone wants to follow after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. There are certain things you do daily. Jesus just says, hey, just switch it to me. You wake up, you eat, you go to a job, whether you feel like it or not, because you need money, you have to make it. You're going to run into those exact same things with Jesus and following him. He's not asking you to do something that you're honestly not already doing. He's asking you to shift your focus towards him. And so what he's saying is, take up your cross daily and follow me, because whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life because of me will save it. It's such an odd paradox, isn't it? So if I'm losing my life, my status, what I'm going for here, I'm actually saving it with Jesus? This is where we're going to go much deeper. Now, I'm going to show you what Kyle Eidemann says to kind of pull this together. He says, the best way to understand what Jesus is wanting from us as followers is to compare how we pursue him to how we would pursue someone with whom we want to have a romantic relationship, okay? Okay. So think about this in those terms. When I was pursuing Amanda, I did some crazy and irrational things to go after her. For an example, she did dance and gymnastics. I worked construction, so I was up super early, working out in the weather all day, dead tired when I got home, and I couldn't see her when I got off work because she was at work and then she had practice after that. So I would go sit in the parking lot of her dance studio, wait for her to come out so I could drive her home and have eight minutes with her on the drive home. Crazy, right? Super romantic, I know you're jealous. I started, she, after that, I would actually go by her house at 4.30 or 5 in the morning and drop notes under her windshield wiper just to tell her I love her. And everyone said, oh, yeah. She started doing really well. She always did well. So I started going to her competition. She was really good. She, she was going to compete in nationals in Myrtle Beach. I took off work, drove 14 hours by myself to go watch her in a competition, slept on the floor of her and her mom's hotel room. But hey, you do what you have to do for love, right? My friends told me I was crazy and that they hoped she was worth it. Well, clearly she was. That's what the pause was for. Thank you. If you're married or have been married, you've ever had a boyfriend or girlfriend who just really likes someone, you know exactly what I'm talking about. And this is what Jesus is talking about when he tells us to follow after him. Let me ask you, do you have any stories of pursuing Jesus like you have someone you love? When people would look at you and go, man, you're crazy. I hope he's worth it. Because this is what Jesus is after in our pursuit of him and our following of him. Like, we'll have these stories when we want to get the guy or the girl. But then Jesus is like, yeah, I want those same stories, though. Because to the world, it's going to look like nonsense. Jesus tells a story in Matthew 13 about a farmer who's plowing a field and finds a buried chest with a massive precious stone in it. When men would go off to war or the threat of being enslaved, 
uh, was a reality, they would oftentimes take their treasures and their valuables and they would bury them out in the field. And if they died and never came back for it, as long as you own that land, what you found was yours. So Jesus says that man goes home, sells every possession he has, literally everything, so he can go get the money to go buy that field. The guy's friends and family start to think he's lost his mind and he's throwing his life away because it just doesn't make sense to them. But when we discover the life that we can have in Jesus, we are to come after him like that man has pursued the treasure worth of great price. Spectators will be careful not to get carried away. Followers understand that following Jesus is a pursuit that may cost them everything, but it's the best investment that they could ever make. Followers will do some crazy things for love, but spectators want to play it safe. See, Jesus is calling us to something different, something higher, something more. And when we're faced with the reality of believing or following, you guys, especially if we've believed for a really long time and not followed, you are faced with a really big decision. I know. Because right now, you may even be looking through the course of your life going, man, all of this stuff I'm going to have to change. But let me just offer this up to you, okay? Okay. In your salvation, in your surrender, hopefully somebody said to you, this is what following Jesus actually means. It's not just enough to believe him. He calls you to go all in with him. And if you've ever surrendered your life here at City Life, that's exactly what we've told you. Because we want you to know exactly what it is that you're surrendering your life to. And so honestly, it really shouldn't be this difficult for us because this is the way that our lives should start in surrender to Jesus. But I understand because I've been there, we drift off, we start to believe some of the things of the world, we start to pursue different things that Jesus, and then all of a sudden we're stuck looking back going, wow, this is going to be a really big deal to undo. But can I say something to you, church? It's really not that big. I'm going to show you what I mean. So let me read you something from Kyle Eidelman. Um, he, he has been incredible through this series for us because he, he gives such... Um, practical things. Let me, let me read you this. There's a fear among fans that going all in, they're going to miss out. Fans or spectators want to have just enough of the pleasure without having to risk feeling any pain. We want to enjoy what's available to us without having to sacrifice for it. Instead of come after, we hold back. It's not that we don't want a relationship with Jesus. We do. We just don't want it to cost us very much. Let's use a romance metaphor. It's like a man and a woman who've been dating. They get pretty serious, and she wants to get married. He loves her and doesn't want to lose her, but he doesn't want to get married. He's afraid that if he makes that kind of commitment, it will require too much of him, or somehow he'll miss out on something better. So he makes the suggestion, hey, why don't we move in together? Translated, how about I get all the benefits of marriage without having to make any of the commitments and sacrifices? This is a spectator. This is a true story about a guy that I was discipling four or five years ago. He was sitting in my discipleship group, and he was living with his girlfriend. They both went to this church. And I said, why are you living with her? And he said, it's so much easier. I have a house. She has a house. It's easier to do this. I said, do you love Jesus? Yes. Are you going to follow him? Yes. Do you love her? Yes. I said, then move out and marry her. He said, okay. And I did their wedding the next week because he was like, I'm all in. He's like, I I want to follow Jesus. I want to do what's right by her, and I want all of the benefits. And he said, okay, I'm in. This is what I'm going to do. But see, church, for us, a lot of times it's like cohabitating with Jesus where we want the benefit, but we don't necessarily want to go all in for the risk. And this is what Jesus is like, that's not following me. You have to be willing to go all in and assume the risk with me because it will be worth it. But... What if I'm describing your relationship with Jesus? Here's where we're going to kind of pull this all back in, okay? Let me tell you what to do. There is a word that describes this lack of pursuit. It's the word apathy. By definition, it means a lack of interest, enthusiasm, or concern. For some of you, you just have spiritual apathy. But when that spiritual apathy reaches a point where you realize it, here's what your life might look like. You reach a point when you simply say, I don't care. 
Somebody may say to you, God loves you. He's sent his son to die for you. He's for the sins of the world. You're forgiven. And you would just shrug your shoulders in response and go, I know, it's amazing, isn't it? Where one day that that floored you. One day that moved you to tears. One day that moved you to surrender your life to him. Now, as we know, my 25 years of marriage have not all been a honeymoon. Those butterfly feelings go away and real love digs in. And real love is difficult and hard because it requires two people giving and sacrificing and moving in the same direction. Well, our guarantee from God and Jesus is he'll never move away from that spot. He'll always be the one that's giving and loving and pursuing. We're the ones that start to get flaky in the relationship. We start to get apathetic about what it actually costs him. You know, we do this in human relationships too. I remember, you know, if you've lost somebody very close to you, I mean, the way that that felt and the hurt and the pain, man, it is so difficult and it is so deep at first. And then time happens. And the hurt gets a little bit less. And you start to deal with it just a little bit more. And you start to have the reality of your life without that person there. And then you move into a new reality. See, we do this in our everyday lives, too, where these passionate things, these things that hurt us so deeply, they will go away with time. But this crazy, passionate, burning love for Jesus is not supposed to be one of those things. You know know why Jesus says about communion, do this as often as you eat and drink? Because he constantly wants you to have a reminder of his sacrifice on the cross. Like if we're to come together at every meal, everything we put in our mouth to drink or eat and go, man, I cannot believe you rescued me, Jesus. You know all my sin. Nobody else does. You do, and you still did it. It's crazy. And it should keep this passion burning inside of us. But we just move into these places of spiritual apathy. We've lost that loving feeling. So... Maybe there was a time you follow, but the passion is gone. The pursuit is over. You ready? I have good news for you. Last verse. Look at this. Revelation 2. Here's what Jesus says. He's speaking to a church. Look at verse 4. Here's what he says. But I have this against you. You have abandoned the love you had at first. You've lost that loving feeling. Remember then how far you have fallen, repent, and do the works you did at first. Okay, now that's where this verse stops, but then there's a conjunction, and he goes, otherwise I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. You hear me talk about repentance all the time. Confession is the start. It's where we acknowledge our sin. Repentance is the action of turning away from that sin, right? So Jesus himself is speaking to the church of Revelation. Now, he go, of Ephesus in Revelation, he goes, remember then how far you've fallen. He's calling you to look back to when your spiritual life was in a heavy pursuit of him. He goes, remember that? He said, repent and do the things you first did. I told you it wasn't that hard. You guys excited? <laughs> it's really not. We make this so complicated. We make this like, oh my gosh, my life is over. I'm going to lose my job. I'm going to lose my house. I'm going to be driving a bicycle. This is horrible. Jesus is like, no, you, if you're a follower of Jesus, you did pursue me at one time. Repent and start doing that again. Yeah, okay, some of those other conversations may happen and... I don't know how it's going to play out for you, but this part's not that hard. Church, there's an otherwise in there. You pay attention to those. <laughs> Jesus is like, hey, I'm going to come and I'm going to actually remove your lampstand from its place, which means you're no longer going to be considered my church unless you repent. Here's what I want to tell you about our lives, okay? God is... We cannot even fathom his grace, his mercy, his love, and all of the patience he has with us. But there is a point. I don't know when it is. It's really, really long. Where Jesus will say, okay, you want and you're pursuing these things so much. How about it? It's called passive wrath. 
Now, you want to know how you're not in it? Because you're sitting here hearing this today, and God's like, hey, pay attention. Otherwise, this may be the journey of your life. See, it's not that hard, church. Get on your knees next to your bed and talk to God about your day. Turn on some worship music in your car and sing along. Grab a one-year Bible and start reading and meditating on God's word. Even if you don't initially feel like doing some of those things, it will begin to stir the fire that has grown dim. Kyle goes on to say, I would also challenge you to wake up this morning, gather together with followers who are passionately pursuing Jesus, and I think you'll find their passion to be contagious. Recommit your love to God and then passionately pursue him. David put it this way in the Psalms, that my soul follows hard after you. And this is what you want your life to be about. Now, there's been tons of theories and proven things that have said you are who you hang around. Show me your friends, I'll show you your future. How many passionate followers of Jesus are you around? Are you the passionate one that other people want to be around? So there are things that you can do to change your environment to actually make this happen pretty quickly. But I just want you to look across the landscape of your life and see where it is you spend your time, what you spend your money on, what your time is spent doing. And if it doesn't line up with this today, I I just want you to see that verse again, and let's not make that this hard. Here's where it starts for us. You ready? Those of you that are followers of Jesus... God, I'm not following you. You have to be honest with him. If you're not, I believe you, but I'm not following you. Would you please forgive me for that? The Bible says he will say yes. That is one thing that's incredible that we should be rejoicing about because sometimes when we ask people to forgive us, they're like, "Eh, I don't know, maybe. Then they hold it over you for the rest of your days. Jesus is like, yes, I will. But remember this picture. So let's say that this is God behind me and that is sin this way. I can actually confess while going deeper in sin. God, will you please forgive me? I'm so sorry. I'll never do this again. He says, yes. God, will you please forgive me? I'm so sorry. I'll never do this again. And I just keep getting further away from him. My repentance starts when I stop, I turn back around, and I start to come back towards him because I've confessed Now I'm moving back towards him. And then the the biblical picture in James is like, I actually get back behind him and I'm following him once again. I am no longer out in front of him opposing him. So see, there's action that is needed for you. If you're going to confess that you haven't been following, there's repentance that needs to follow that. This can take some time. But this is why we're here, to walk with you and to help you. This is why City Life communities are coming online soon. So we're going to have people sitting right over here at these couches. We're going to have people all across the back. What we're going to ask you to do is just be honest about this. What is the pursuit of your life? Have you lost that loving feeling? If you have, let's deal with it today. These people are here to pray with you. As the band comes up, we're going to close, and we're just going to reflect on what we've heard today, okay? I just wanted to ask you where you're at with all this. Maybe you're sitting here and you're like, hey, you know, I hear all this. It makes sense, but I'm actually not, I don't even believe in Jesus. Man, I'm so glad you're here because all those people that are standing around ready to pray, myself included, we would love to have a conversation with you too. Let us show you what it's like to believe in something bigger than you that will truly give you the life that you're actually searching for. I'm so confident in that statement because I am literally living that statement. I tried every possible thing I could try in the world, and it always left me empty. So however it is that you would respond right now, if you're not yet a follower of Jesus, if you would be willing to trust us with a conversation, please meet us in the back or meet us over here on the couches. If you don't want to move from your seat, slip your hand up and we'll come to you. For those of you that are followers of Jesus, maybe you have the believing part down, but you're not following. Today can be the day that that either starts for the first time or restarts in your life again. I mean, this all in. 
And so you have to come back the next two weeks because we're putting this really practical on how to do this. So for some of you, you can sit by yourself and you can confess and you can start this process of repentance and I just want to encourage you to do that. For some of you, you need help. This is why we have these people praying. For some of you, you are doing this. You're following hard after Jesus. Your heart is his. Your life is his. Would you just be praying for the people in the room right now that they're, they're not there yet? Be spiritual brothers and sisters. Look around and ask God to show you who to go to. This is what community is for. God, we love you. We thank you so much for your word, your grace that we cannot even begin to measure, your mercy that is exactly the same length and distance. And God, we pray that if we've lost that loving feeling, it would be reignited passionately right now. We love you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you guys stand? Amen.